This is Daniela from Earth for All interviewing Bruce Fenton who is a lecturer, writer and researcher in the occult, esoteric and paranormal. Um, Bruce, can you please tell us how you got into this interesting world of the supernatural? <laughs> yeah, it's a, a fairly good question, big subjects. Um, really, I suppose for myself it all goes back, um, well, 20 years I suppose really. I mean, uh, my first experience of the, I suppose you'd say the, uh, yeah, the supernatural, um, was actually telepathy, which was something I started having spontaneous telepathy events um, when I was 15 years old, um, 36 now, so it's you know, a fair old while ago. Um, that, I mean, I actually remember the first occurrence, and that was um, literally um, at my family home, uh, feeling sort of unnerved and anxious for no real reason. And then I remember walking up onto the road, sort of just looking, and just suddenly I just had this awareness. Um, that uh, someone I was close to that um, that they had been arrested for being held in a police house. Um, later that day, there was a confirmation that, that had happened that there had been a, an illegal rave party, which were common back in the 1990s in the UK, and that a, you know a whole group of people had been rounded up and arrested, including this person. So that was probably the the first memorable event I had of a kind of knowing at a distance um, from someone. Um, but those went on and in increased in frequency and in complexity. Um, some of them were extremely weird and random. Um, I remember another time being in a club in Essex when I was at university there and being fairly drunk, I suppose, but um, talking to a girl and just saying to her, you know, I, I know I know your name, I can tell you your name. And, you know, she was like, oh, you, you don't know me, you can't tell me your name. And, and so I just blurred out the name and, you know, it was her name. And so she sort of said, you know, you must be talking to my friends, you must have been doing But I hadn't been, you know, I just had a name coming to my head. You know, and that became, you know, fairly normal. I used to have quite a lot of occurrences like that. So these these really, if you like, were my entrance into this world of psychic powers and supernatural events. Um, I mean, I suppose in fairness, I mean, I already had an existing interest in um, what I call, I suppose, unexplained mysteries back even further to 11 years old um, and that came about through my grandmother on my father's side who used to give me these um, little uh, collectible tea cards, I mean they were this big and they'd have a picture on one side and a little bit of information on the other. And you'd have um, for example the Great Pyramid and Mysteries of the Builders of the Pyramid, uh, Crystal Skulls, um, Giant Spheres, Rock Spheres in Latin America. And all kinds of these sort of, I guess, famous mysteries, from the you know Mary Celeste and uh, the Loch Ness monster. You know, there's I think there probably about forty of them in all. And, you know, this really started my fascination with unexplained mysteries. So um, I had an ex you know, like I said, an existing interest, but really I didn't enter into that world of strange events until I was fifteen. So just four years later. Um, in terms of real research, I mean, at that age, not a lot. I mean, reading books on ghosts and um, a little bit on you know UFOs and uh, of course there was not really an internet back then so you know I remember having just a you know BBC micro computer and you know ZX81 and stuff. so you know the computers weren't a big part of my research back then you know you buy the odd book from the charity shop or something about ghosts and, um, but uh, yeah as I got older I mean I I started to I suppose get more seriously involved and uh, I remember around. 1920, when I'd started university, um, my, my first, I suppose, deliberate experimentation with an occult practice was was working with a Ouija board. And this is something I know that probably quite a lot of people have had a go at or been at a, a party or something and someone's done it. Um, there was a group of us in the kitchen of the student flat that we were in, in the halls of residence, and um, my then girlfriend had suggested a Ouija board and so we we all sort of four or five of us decided to do it my brothers were just watching and uh, you know, pretty quickly the, the cup started the glass started moving across the board and you know we started spelling out names and answers to questions and you know some people got a bit spooked out and others just thought you know it must just be someone pushing it which I think on at least a couple of occasions it, it was 
um, but you know, after that person had sort of stopped pushing it, it still seemed to keep going. Um, so I, I was kind of left very interested in this, but at the same time a bit sceptical because, of course, when you're you know doing something with other people, you know there is always that that you know opening for someone to have cheated it. So I decided to make my own Ouija board and use it in my bedroom, in my as a residence. So. You know, I, I made a simple board. I won't explain exactly how to make. I'm encouraging people to make them because I, mean, I think that they can be quite dangerous. And so I made this Ouija board, and I would work with it at night on my own and ask, you know, if anyone was there and if they would talk to me and, you know, if they're good or bad and all this, you know, the sort of precursor questions. And I had quite a few conversations. I mean, I remember one that sounded like there was a, you know, an entity, if you like, that was communicating, claiming to be some princess, somebody. Um, I mean, there were others were so memorable um, but yeah I did this on several occasions I mean how many exactly I can't remember certainly several and it always worked I mean it was always pretty quick the glass would start moving and it would make rational sense what was coming from it you know it would answer my questions um, give names or dates and um, so it was you know it seemed to work for all intents and purposes what I did find with the Ouija board though however is that you know it, started to be more like it was playing a game with me and I felt more that these spirits were not necessarily malevolent but certainly I suppose mischievous at the very least um, they certainly I, I would say were liars um, at least for that reason I don't recommend the Ouija board but it, it certainly proved to me beyond any reasonable doubt that there were psychic forces at work in the world I mean I mean okay I'd had my experiences with telepathy but there hadn't been an experiment, so it was just something that started happening. Whereas the Ouija board had been a deliberate experiment, you know, and it had proved to me that there was other entities, forces, if you like, consciousness out there. So that's that's kind of, I guess, where um, I entered into this world, you know, and it's particularly and that's where I, I guess a university where I began to actually look more seriously and experiment for myself. Um, Telepathy-wise, you know, that carried on, you know, fairly randomly. Um, I didn't make any great effort to develop it. Um, it was only later again that um, you know things progressed and you know I began to have um, other experiences that that came into it as well. Um, I guess if I look back I suppose things really didn't become much more serious with it until you know the end of university. I mean there's not too many events during that period. And I suppose this is going back to um, around the turn of the millennium that uh, I was kind of finishing university. I mean, the, the only notable experience that I had, you know, before leaving university beyond the Ouija board was, you know, on a holiday in, in the Caribbean, which was, you know, I'm half Trinidadian, um, I've got a family in Trinidad, and so we were out there for Christmas for, you know, 1999 and, you know, New Year's 2000. Um, and during that trip, I had quite a memorable experience. Um, I was sleeping in a room at one of the uh, house of one of my aunts, and I just remember that it was pretty early hours of the morning. I was just on the edge of waking, not quite awake, but I could hear this whispering, you know, this voice talking into my ear, and it was saying something along the lines of, "I've seen you around, and you know, I really like you," and you know, was, I suppose you would say whispering sweet nothings in my ear. Um, and as my brain began to kind of process this and wake up, I became sort of more sort of aware of the fact that this shouldn't be happening, that, you know, there was nobody in that house who would be saying these things to me because, you know, they were relatives, so it, it, it didn't make sense what the voice was saying. And this kind of, I guess, jolted me awake. And so I, I looked around quickly and all I saw was just this fleeting black shadow thing just sort of fly off into the corner of the room and disappear. Um, there was something, you know, even sort of more peculiar, if you like, about this, because you know, being in the Caribbean, it's hot, it's you know, tropical weather continually. Yet, uh, whilst the voice had been talking, it had been very cool in the room. As soon as that I, you know, went to look to see who it was, the room went back to the normal temperature, sweltering hot. You know, so there was also a physical effect with whatever it had been that was there. So, I suppose those are the the main happenings, you know, in my life before I became more of a serious researcher. To these things, and before I done any sort of web articles or books or anything, or anything that like. So, what took you into creating web articles and eventually your website, Twenty Twelve Rising and Earth Rule? 
Well, um, 2012 Rising was the first one, and, and that one actually, that was quite a, yeah, quite a peculiar event that caused me to um, create that website. And this is going, this is around, let me think, 2000, late 2001, I'd say, um, possibly early 2002, um, where I was just kind of beginning to delve more seriously into the issues of whether there was survival of the soul after death, and I joined a website for a spiritualist centre based in the Brecon Beacons of Wales and um, it was called Hafani Covid. I, mean, I, I believe it still exists but is I think under different management. Um, but this you know, this centre had its own online chat site and I would go on there and I would sort of converse with psychic mediums that were you know aligned to the spiritualist movement or to just the other guests of the site who usually had some interest in these subjects. Um, and it wasn't just about uh, the spirit, you know, there were all sorts of um, topics there, you know, to do with psychic phenomena, the supernatural and holistic therapies. And so, I, you know, I found it fascinating, so I'd go on there quite a bit. Um, but on this one particular occasion, I was talking to um, a young lady who was also English um, named Tracy. And I, unfortunately, I've lost contact with Tracy, but perhaps one day I'll, you'll contact me if she watches one of these. Um, we were having a conversation about, I think, some sort of holistic therapies, I, I believe, and quite all of a sudden, I found myself no longer in my chair at my computer in my house, but instead literally flying through the air and above a jungle scene with, you know, emerald green tree canopy below, um, bright sunshine, much like we have here today in Ecuador, um, heading towards this stepped pyramid, a white stepped pyramid. I was not an expert on pyramids or anything like, but I recognized that it had to be somewhere in the Americas, some kind of Mesoamerican structure. Um, the things that stood out immediately, apart from the fact, of course, that I was flying through the air, was that, you know, I didn't seem to have a body. So I know that this was not, uh, you know, a matter of me physically being transported somewhere. It was some kind of astral event. I progressed towards this this large gleaming white step pyramid, uh, which itself stood out to me as being quite clearly newly built. I mean, it was shining white stone. You know, it's uh, nothing like the way, say, um, you know, an ancient Mesoamerican pyramid looks today, with a sort of grayish white colour. You know, these were freshly cut stone. So, as I approached this structure, you know, I found myself knowing certain things. You know, intuitively knowing certain things about it. I was aware that there was a community of people somewhere nearby in the jungle, um, that this building was a kind of beacon for them, and it literally you know, it was a glowing white beacon in the jungle, um, and that they would be able to see it from some distance. That I was also aware that there was a secret tunnel in the top, I mean there was a small, uh, at, the, at the top of this step pyramid there's a kind of platform, there was a little temple structure, and I was aware that inside the temple structure there was a secret sort of trap door that led into a tunnel that went down into the building. Uh, how I knew that, I, 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 can't, I couldn't say at the time. And then beyond that, I noticed that there was also a man on top of this pyramid. And this chap was you know, dressed in, I, suppose, I refer to it as shamanic type clothes. I guess if you think of perhaps a North American medicine man, uh, so it's, it's kind of like that. He sent out the, the airs of something like that. Um, and he was doing some kind of ritual which involved him gesticulating and he was holding up some kind of staff and he was quite clearly sort of saying something but I couldn't hear it and I, you know and in my memory I do not remember any sounds at all so this seemed to be just a visual experience in that respect um, although perhaps there were and I'm, I'm forgetting them now but I mean it's going back 10 years but um, there was then at that point uh, a sudden kind of returning back to my body and you know I was back at the computer again. What made this even more bizarre was that the other person I'd been talking to, Tracy, had had the same experience, basically. She'd found herself lying over the jungle towards this pyramid uh, without her body, um, but the difference being that she picked up some information I hadn't. Um, for instance, she actually gave me a year. She said the year that she had intuited while she was there was 675 AD. Um, she also added that she had a strong knowing that the experience had been meant just for me, not for her, which, you know, at the time, I had no idea why it should be meant for either of us, let alone just for myself. 
Um, but this was the event really that led me to start looking into Mesoamerican lost cultures. I, mean, I, I recognised uh, quite quickly that the temple was in a style like the Mayans um, and that this had to be a Mayan temple. Uh, and I began to sort of look a bit deeper into the Mayans and into their, I suppose, their spiritual understandings, their prophecies, their, um, you know, I guess, the mysteries of their civilization. Um, I can't remember exactly which books I started off with. I seem to remember having uh, a book by, um, let me think, it's Adrian Gilbert on the Mayan, I think it's the Mayan Cycles of Time, or I, I may not be wrong, but certainly one of his books uh, on the Mayans, and in there seeing a picture of this, you know, a temple in Palenque, which for some reason reminded me strongly of this temple I'd seen in experience. Um, and this, this really was my kind of, I guess, confirmation that, you know, this was, it was something to do with the Mayans, it was something to do with Palenque, um, and that, you know, I needed to explore more into this. There must be a reason for me to have such an extreme experience, that there was obviously something in this culture that I needed to know about. And so that began a, you know, several years of being involved with uh, reading up on the Mayan calendar, uh, Mayan indigenous or spiritual techniques, the sort of shamanism used by the Mayans, um, the kind of plant medicines they used with um, psychedelic effects, uh, looking into you know the, what remained of their lost of the knowledge they had, you know, through some of the, the books of their wisdom which still existed, and, um, and really sort of gaining more of an understanding of why they had this sort of strange countdown in process of the long count calendar, which um, ended basically the 13th back turn of it ended in December 2012. Um, but my website I began back in 2007, I believe, December 2007, um, about about the mines and other things, uh, which was yes 2012rising.com. Um, so for several years I wrote you know many articles, I mean well over a hundred articles uh, posted to the site, covering you know not just the mines but you know. I suppose my explorations into consciousness and altered consci altered states of consciousness, um, trying to get an understanding of how supernormal, psychic, and um, you know paranormal events worked, um, and how an ancient civilization might have some sort of prophetic knowledge and be able to track major changes with the calendar. Um, so my my website really delved into all of that and more. Um, so that that was kind of really how. 2012 Rising came about through, you know, a really bizarre experience. Okay. And what about Earth for All, your second website? Well, Earth for All, yes, is more recent. I mean, I initially um, started Earth for All about, let me think, I suppose it was probably two or three years ago. It must be at least three years ago. But I didn't do very much with it. The original idea mm -hmm. was I was going to use it as a um, uh, an online e-zine, a sort of magazine covering all kinds of um, spiritual um, subjects as well as supernatural subjects and you know, working with other people on it um, and perhaps adding things like a forum and um, you know and getting other guest writers on board but because of situations in my own life I, I really would have to say I just didn't have the enough energy to get that done I mean I, I did have you know, I did work with a few people on it, but I mean they had their own projects going and things, and so you know really it was mostly myself doing it, and also there was yeah like I said there was just a lot going on in my own life, and I I suppose after a while of trying to get it going, I kind of gave up on it and left it and just you know continued to focus on 2012rising.com. Mm -hmm. um, it was only in the last part of the last year really that I've I've renewed it for all and made it into a uh, a central site really for myself, for things that are happening and of course for um, the new books and you know, some of the, um, I guess, the you know, more recent events that have gone on out here in Ecuador mm -hmm. to become more of a hub for my, my own work, if you like, mm -hmm. rather than being a, an electronic magazine. Um, but yeah, that kind of, the idea of Record is to cover mainly two subject areas, I suppose, um, that's represented in the two blogs I have on the site, which is one being the Stargate blog and the other being the Star Seed blog. And the Stargate blog is essentially a, a complete, I suppose, well, an almost complete backstory of, of how I ended up writing the latest book, mm -hmm. or being a co-author, I should say, on the latest book, which is um, Ancient Aliens in Australia, 
Euclidean origins of humanity. Um, that blog really goes into the whole backstory of, of how I ended up in you know, being involved with this subject. In fact, it's entitled at the moment, um, I put the title on it as um, uh, Transcending Reality, How a London Investment Banker Accidentally Opened a Splidian Stargate. So it's a bit of a mouthful, but uh, it gives a good idea of what that blog's about. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a serialised ebook, really, uh, but it goes through everything I've just explained and a lot more about the last um, sort of 10 to 15 years of experiences that have really funneled me towards this, you know, this happening with these Bladeans and the new book. Um, the other blog, which is not too much on it just yet, is the Starseed blog, which is really is um, updates from here in Ecuador and you know this video is uh, like a video log and again clarifying some of what I've learned along the way and of course not just what I've learned but those around me have experienced and learned along the way and a kind of a share, a more personal sharing of you know what's been useful and what's not and the kind of experiences that are possible for people and to hopefully make people that go through strange experiences feel a bit less alone and more connected, you know, in that they can see that there's people out there having some very full on experiences and often not being believed, of course, you know, which, mm -hmm. you know, which is something obviously I'm quite used to. Mm -hmm. um, you've written over a hundred articles for your first website, now working on Earth for All. Um, you've also written two books, first one, 2012 Rising, The Last Soul King. Yeah. Your second book has just been released. Um, along with myself, e, um, Stephen and Evan Strong from Australia. Um, ancient Aliens in Australia, um, Origins, uh, Pleiadian Origins of Humanity. Um, how did you come to, about writing this second book? The first book um, is quite different to this second book. Um, what, what sort of made you want to write something <laughs> relating to Australia and tying it all in the way it has tied in with um, Stephen and Evan's research? Yeah, I suppose that, um, I mean, the first book really, you know, covered the research that I'd done, mm -hmm. you know, over the last decade or so. Um, not all of it, but, but in a particular category, I suppose, of, of potential massive changes on the planet the kind of events that can bring about those changes, mm -hmm. the cultures that have warned about them coming, such as the Hopi and the Maya, uh, who've said you know they see these big changes ahead, um, an analysis of the, I suppose the likelihood of these events, the evidence for them. Sure. Um, the second part of that book was uh, about how you know, we came to be you know involved with Bladeans, and then the information that they had given us, which largely was warnings again about potential events that could affect Earth, you know, what, what mm -hmm. they might be like and how people could perhaps prepare for them. Mm -hmm. So in that that book I wrote because I felt that, you know, it was necessary, well, I had to make a decision, you know, does one keep one's information to oneself um, for a fear that if it's all, you know, if, or if some of it is wrong or, if it, you know, you'll be sort of criticised for that, mm -hmm. or do, do you share that kind of information in case something is going to mm -hmm. happen and you, you share the warning with the proviso that you know you don't know what will happen but this is what your your research has said and this is what your your sources your contacts have said mm -hmm. so that's what that book was really about I mean, it was quite as you say it was quite different to the second book the second book I wrote because I felt that the simple fact that the Pleiadians were so involved in our in human history was in itself incredibly important um, as important as any warnings they could give us. I think that simply the fact that they existed uh, and that they had been involved with humanity for you know, hundreds of thousands of years and were continuing to be involved with humanity was in itself uh, as just as big a story, if not a bigger story, than the kind of things that they mm -hmm. wanted me to say or my research. Mm -hmm. How did you come to have contact with the Pleiadians? I mean, not everybody does, and some people don't even know who they are, where they come from, yeah. or what they are. Um, how did this happen, and how, how has it affected your life on a personal level? Yeah, well, I suppose really. I mean, the you know, the first time I had any kind of contact with this subject. I mean, with the Pleiadians. I mean, uh, when it happened, they didn't know it had anything to do with Pleiadians. Mm -hmm. This was um, during a, a shamanic journey that I took, going back to two thousand and. Early 2003, if I have it right, 
um, using what's called Hawaiian baby wood rose seeds, which mm -hmm. are, contain um, LSA, which is a natural hallucinogen similar to LSD, but um, which is used for shamanic journey or altering, altering a state of you know, consciousness and changing your perceptions. Uh, and entering the shamanic world, the other dimensions of existence. Uh, and it was whilst you know on this journey, and this is I was living in London actually. I was still then an investment banker. Um, it was whilst on this journey that I had a remembering of a past life. I mean, I actually had a couple of different experiences first, which were not related to this, which were, were in my mind more profound than this remembering of a past life. Uh, which I'll leave to the side for a moment, but this, this third experience during the journey uh, was that I was suddenly this humanoid being in a small craft that was on its way down towards the planet Earth, in, being pursued by enemy craft, uh, receiving you know, fire and damaged, um, and that I was aware that I'd been on a mission, that I was this alien being who was part of a mission to go to Earth to assist the resident hominid population of that time, who were in a state of bondage to another race and to basically help uh, them free themselves and develop themselves spiritually and to, I guess, head towards rejoining a brotherhood of, of beings of the light who, who believe in the upward movement of consciousness of all humanoids um, throughout reality, uh, whether in this reality or in other dimensions, uh, and that there is a collective of beings that were, you know, working together to bring this about. Um, specifically, my role seemed to be some kind of, I suppose, not military as such, but like a police force or something. And I had a, a blue uniform, and I was very tall, and, you know, I had this awareness kind of, you know, of my role, and, you know, that there had been many other beings involved in what happened, um, but that something terrible had happened to the others. And that you know, I was basically you know just going to sort of crash land on Earth, um, and then the experience really sort of trailed off, and then I was sort of back in my room. So that, at the time, I had no idea this connected to the Pleiadians. I mean, much much later, I found out it, it does. In fact, it connects. It is why I, you know, partly why I've written this book is that you know I found out later that other people had memories of this event, and that there were engravings in Australia that echoed the same event and that you know, it's become clear that this was a Pleiadian mission. Um, so that was my first encounter with them, if you like. I mean, over the years, I've certainly seen the name Pleiadians come up, you know, occasionally in, in my sort of trailing the web and looking at books and things that mention UFOs and abductions and aliens. You know, I've, I had no special knowledge of them, but yeah, I'd heard of them. It was only in um, 2011, really, that uh, I suppose my personal connection to them and clarification um, as to their relationship to me and, and their existence and all the rest of it sort of came about. Uh, and that was whilst on a trip to Egypt, which was in November of 2011. And I actually, I suppose long story short, I was involved in a, a kind of a, a private meeting between myself and a couple of other friends who are also researchers at a site called Abu Ghurab where we arranged to be there in the evening. And um, it was at that site that um, we ended up opening a stargate to the Pleiades. That's really interesting. <laughs> How did that affect you? Did you, I mean, did you know at that point what you were doing or was it something spontaneous? Did anything magical happen? Uh, yes, I suppose, I mean, before we actually went to the site, uh, my friend Richard, who uh, runs a book called richardgabriel.info for those interested and has a book Echoes from the Chamber uh, I was thinking about more about him but he had actually picked up on the fact that something very important was going to happen that night at the site so although I didn't know what nor did he we did have that as a precursor before we even got there okay. um, and it was only once on the site that during our time there that um, his partner Judith spontaneously began chanting open the stargate as we stood on what we now know to be the stargate platform um, which is known to the academics as a hotep offering platform if i very right but um, we would suggest otherwise especially considering what's happened since doing that great thank you